Hello everybody, how are you today? Forgive the little fuzzy in the air, it's not the best camera, but I truly appreciate you guys taking time out to come stop by and watch my video. And I always, always appreciate it. Please subscribe, please like, please share. And again, please subscribe, like, and share. First of all, my name is Dr. Antonio Arnold. I am a disabled veteran, retired pastor, been a pastor in ministry for 22 years, been in the military 18 and a half years prior to my injuries. And guys, I'm just going to share just a little bit of my credentials. I do have a doctor in divinity. I do have a master of divinity from Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary, Liberty University. I also, and with the emphasis in professional ministry, my intention was to become a chaplain, of course, and a hospital chaplain. Uh, and what else? Uh, yes, also a graduate from the Frederick L. Ray Institute of Biblical Studies with a Master of Divinity as well. I got two. Um, also received and concurred a, a Master of Religious Education, which authorized me to teach, write lesson plans, and to teach you know, advanced biblical studies. I do, do hold a Master of Art in Theological Studies with an emphasis in pastoral counseling. Other credentials I have, also a, a master's, advanced master's degree in biblical studies from the Frederick L. Ray as well. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in independent study with an emphasis of in, uh, manufacturing technology and strengthening and, and with an emphasis in military science because I'm an ROTC graduate as well. And also in digital electronics. So a little touch of engineering, served in the Air Force, water purification, plumbing, served in the Army Civil Affairs, been a chaplain candidate, done quite a few things, served in civil service, and worked at, as an officer through the Department of Justice with the Bureau of Prison and with the Department of Veterans Affairs. That was my last uh, occupation before. All right, so that's just a little bit about myself. I've also been a pastor, been a supply pastor for a uh, um, to a, for a Presbyterian church. I'm not going to name the name. And also been a Baptist minister, pastor, founder of Church Without Walls Ministry, and served as assistant pastor for a number of ministries locally. So with that being said, that takes care of my credentials. I'm an author of three books. One of them is We Are Living in the Finished Work of Christ. We Are Living in the Finished Work of Christ. You know, God draws, Jesus saves, and the Holy Spirit seals. And I'm also the author of Breaking the Chain of Bondage. You know, this book is a little thin. It was my first book I ever published. Uh, I'm really going to detail about the church traditions, politics, and some of the ills that's been hurting the ministries over the years and notice I have a dove and the and star of David and there's a chain being broken the word of God is going to is setting a lot of people's souls and minds free so with that that's the symbols it has nothing to do with anything else other than that hey remember Jesus comes from the line of King David and which is the Jude Hebrew and which is he a Jew, lived as a Jew, walked as a Jew, and died and rose again as King of Kings, Lords of Lords. Also, as, according, as I have shared with you, I have served in the 18 and a half years in the military. I have served both in the Army and Air Force through the Air National Guard, Army through the Army Reserve. And have some served some time, some time of active duty service as well as reserve to TPU. So, but this book right here is called Katrina, Hurricane Katrina and I. And it's based on my experience in New Orleans. I hope everybody see that. It's a testimonial. I want to talk about a little bit just about that. But if I permit, I will talk about each one. First one I want to talk about is this book. Now, what may cause me to want to write this book? Well, just look around you. There's confusion. You got more church in every corner, and then you got mass confusion. A lot of people don't understand the word and making poor decisions. Um, and this, I see God has shown me 
at this time and on this earth age, there's need to be someone who speaks about and to educate the people. A lot of times in Christian education, especially in a small independent Baptist church setting, which I have an opportunity to serve, there's not a great deal of emphasis and we're in the word as far as ecclesiastical studies, you know, system and studies. Nobody wants to learn. And there's very few people who qualify to teach. So, I mean, the pastor is apt to teach. So it makes sense to me if you if there was a, a area where people can be taught at a different levels. Um, one of the things I found that's concerning is that we're keeping saints of God on a third grade level. You know, should give them more studies up to before they can even consider if they were to consider seminary as a continuing education. But, I mean, our secular government does a better job in educating our people than we do. And that's been a concern to me. And a lot of people don't even understand basic biblical proof and truth and history and historic um, that goes along with it. I mean, how, and how it, would, it can connect to our modern society, even though our society is definitely different than the Eastern society of the ancient Israel and the ancient times of where Jesus and the early church. Okay? So, here's a, just a few things I, my book has covered on um, in the finished work of Christ. And you can get this, you can get your copy from the number of sources. You can get it at Amazon. You can also get your copy at Books and Billions. Uh, there's a number of digital sites you can download it um, for, um, and, and, and so forth. And I can go on and on. Now, a lot of people in churches do not understand what Christianity is. So my book covers what is Christianity. What is it? I mean, what can, can you say in, in an in a, in a essay or a paragraph, what is Christianity to you? And a lot of people couldn't do that. I mean, I, there was confusion. A lot of people didn't know what Christian is. Uh, the church, we talk, uh, to cover a little bit about the church, which is on page five. What is the church? Now, how is the church? What's the difference between the visible church and the invisible church? What is a church? What it means to call out. A church means to call out. We are all called out to assemble together. We are all church. We are all individuals who are church. We are church. We are church. Each individual church is a bunch of people who come together and assemble. It's not the name of the building; it's just the name of the people. So that I cover just a little bit of that um, church order of the church, and everyone should know what the order of the church and how the church is governed, uh, how the church is regulated, and how the church and, how, and historically, historically. Um, the man where, where the church um, first started historically, and we know 70 AD, that great day in, in the book of Acts, you know, a great day where the disciples or the apostles assembled together for that great power of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. So it talks about that, okay? It also talks about women in the church, their roles in the church, um, how the role of a church has changed to a more feminine-led, um, in my opinion, uh, ministry, and, and how that is has been a, a, de a definite uh, strain in the governing body within the local church. Now, there's a lot of mainline denomination of church that's at a high their hierarchy and their government body and who rules and govern the, the entire organization. I mean, we're talking about millions and billions of people. Um, some accept women ministers and, and so and, and and apostles and as they call them and and bishops. And even though the Bible said what a bishop is, a lot of them feel um, based on the movement in America, and I'm only speaking in American term, that they should hold that same leadership. Now, I'm not saying that leaders, women not, don't make great leaders. They do. And they do have a major role to play in ministry. They do. 
However, there is a role in what the Bible describes what their role of leadership should be. And a lot of times people get combined because they got leaders who are not well versed in the Bible. And sometimes we just do what we want to do. And <laughs> that's when all the confusion. But I want you to read it for yourself, guys, and see and you know, share your opinions. You know, and then we get into what are called bylaws. And the bylaws are your articles in the church, which is your laws of the ministry. Uh, each individual organization have their own laws and, and, and ordinances. Some believe in, you know, baptizing in the Holy Spirit. Some believe in baptizing by water and immersion. Some believe in baptizing in sprinkles. You know, depends where you are. And, that, and I can tell you, I can tell you the different baptisms come from different reasons, you know. If you're living in a desert and there's water, very, very limited water. I mean, you don't have to go no further than Saudi Arabia or a certain part of East Africa to understand that water is not always available for immersion. You know, some do sprinkles. Even in wartime, you know, uh, priests are known to take buckets of water and just splash it on soldiers to baptize them. And even in there, during the time of ancient Rome or ancient or Eastern Europe. When they spread to Eastern Europe, and that's another conversation of church history, and that's why I'm a firm believer in, in in getting a quality education because you need to know that you need to know that there's a lot of information about who you are as a saint and where you came from, not just from believing what the Bible says, but also knowing your Christianity, where your Christianity ideals come from, and your organization and your structures. Why you do things in a certain way. And that's why this book comes all talks about traditions in the church. Now, some traditions are just not of God, and there are some traditions that, that's okay. That's within Bible content. So let's continue. We talk about offering. We talk about tithing, the purpose of tithes and the purpose of offerings. How does that relate to the Bible? Does that apply to the, to the modern age Christians of today? Okay. Of course, everybody, every organization needs funds to support for support god don't need your money it doesn't show in the word that god needs your money you don't need your blood offering anymore because jesus fulfilled that but again you got people telling people that god needs your money and that's like telling bringing god to our level and god is not our level jehovah is not our level and neither is his son jesus christ he that both are not at our level the holy ghost is not at our level they are beyond the universe, the galaxies, and beyond that. That's how powerful the big this thing is. But yet we try to bring them down and say, hey, God needs your money. And he doesn't. I mean, I mean this is a piece of paper. He grew the trees. If he owns everything, it's, it's really with no relevance to it. Um, fasting, true worship, blessing, faith, justification, spirit, anointed, tongues. That's a big topic, popular in Pentecostal, non-denominational ages. They're of the early uh, 1910s, 19, I mean, correction, 1915, 1917. That's when they got the big movement, the, uh, the Great Crusades. And a lot of times, speaking in tongues has been evolved over the years, okay? You know, and now they call it baptism of the Spirit. And uh, that's just, that just, just how it is. Um, there's another, there's a talk about that in my book, Discussions. And, uh, and also in this book, too, it's good to get this book first to, before you get the other book. You know, this book has very got a lot of information in it. OK, so we talk about justification, the spirit, anointing, tongues, slain in the spirit. The Holy Spirit, prosperity or prosper, because a lot of ministries are prosperous, you know, prosperity ministries. And their emphasis on how you prosper, but you know, it seems like somebody else is prospering and not the poor. That's just another conversation. Signs and wonders, deliverance, healing, prophets. What is a prophet? What does a prophet do? You know, in regards to scripture, and what's the purpose of the prophet? And do we need a prophet in the 21st century? Good, you know, that's something you have to find out when you get it. Have your Bibles with you too, because there's a lot of scriptures in this book. OK, a lot of scriptures, supporting scriptures, a lot of supporting historic document um, lectures, too. So. OK, uh, it also talks about Jesus, the example, denominations, you know, 
Like I said, there's a lot of governing body. Each denomination is an individual governing body, some as huge as billions of people and structured in such a way. And there are some who are just as small as one uh, congregational or called, or called congregationist, congregational organization. Okay, if you if you can organize a a a, a organization where three hundred congregations are joined together under a common law, a common leadership, and they have selected um you know from regional, state, regional, um, local, and to to national and international, then that's how big that organization is. And I have opportunity <coughs> to experience that. Also had the opportunity as in the growing up in the Baptist side and seeing the Pentecostal side and non denomination side, see that the one structure where um, the group of families form a church been around for years, or one individual, the pastor, is the founding father of that particular movement. Okay. Then I talk a little bit about Islam, the history, uh, some research about the, what the Quran says, uh, how that affects Christian them, how they feel about Christian them, uh, and the dangers of Islam. Uh, That's from a research I was done when I was a student in Liberty University. Also, the government on the shoulders. We're talking about government on the shoulders based on Isaiah and how that affects us. And also that leads right into our Constitution, our First Amendment rights. Our First Amendment right to worship, to assemble, that our government is not a government that will form, just like in Britain, its own church. Okay, And that's what the British have done, because the British Episcopalian Church, or the Church of England, is the Church of England. It belongs to the Church of England, because they broke away from the Catholic Church. They do everything the Catholic Church does, except the king or the queen, which is in this case the queen, is the pope or the father or holy holy mother who's in charge of the church organization as a whole okay that so that's that's important to know ladies and gentlemen then we have talks about um prayer and defending your faith being unapologetic that's on page 203 and how attributes of god because there's a lot of persecution going on in the 21st century right now, and especially in the United States, Canada, and Western Europe, where pastors and Christians are being demined, deemed as uh, taboo because of their beliefs. You, you, know, you don't believe in homosexuality. You consider it taboo. You, they, 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 they belittle you. They, they're saying that you're being judgmental, and we do judge between right and wrong and just like with God do this view us the same way but it, it, it's it's like you know you got to be tolerant you know be being intolerant or not as they were is not inclusive okay you're not inclusive you're not diversity and you and you're definitely not um you know that's another word diversity inclusion and there's something else I can't think of the name of but those are the big three, one of the two of the out of the three, that's the big um, deception of Satan. So, and then we have sovereignty of God, the righteousness of God, the sovereignty of God, the, uh, the wrath of God. Okay, it covers all that. We reap what we sow because it talks about that and all the stuff that's been going on around the country since uh, 2008 and before. Um, those of you who are being called to be camp chaplains. If you've been called to be a chaplain, this is from my experience to uh, pursuing military chaplain per se. Um, there is an article that protects this chaplain individual for their First Amendment rights to speak in according to their faith. Okay, whether it be public prayer or an event where that chaplain is presiding, if under under a government under the government body, whether it be military chaplain or you represent as a chaplain. For the Senate or the House of Representative, or as or in a, a hospital setting, okay, there's rules that you can, but that rule was supposed to protect you as the chaplain from persecutions and um, punishment for saying in Jesus' name, and then saying in Jesus' name really is offensive to a lot of people in government, especially when it's such a diversity 
uh, organization as our government is. And, you know, other people could say Allah, people can say, you know, Elohim you know, or God. But if you say close a prayer in Jesus' name, you just pretty much messed up. So a lot of times politically correctness tell dictates you supposed to uh, say in your name, whoever your name is. And you walk around with the crucifix representation, the crucifix on your chest. That's very concerning because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you pray not pray in Jesus' name, I don't know. I guess it's fine for some and fine for others. But you want to read that because that can help your career uh, stand because it's written. It's written. All right. Uh, final, I got a final message. Watch night, New Year's. Why we celebrate, uh, particularly African American communities. Why they celebrate Watch Night? Um, that's a historic uh, discovery I had to found because I wasn't taught in public school. This I wasn't taught by my parents, but I'm glad. But we've practiced this tradition for years, and and I know the black community has practiced this this um, this tradition. Those who do attend worship. There's a lot of atheists, blacks out there too. So don't think that all blacks go to church they, and, and worship and believe in God or believe in Jehovah or believe in Jesus. A lot of them do. Or Elohim. A lot of them don't. So let's be real. All right. So um, words of and definitions. Uh, this is a great book. If you wanted to study the Bible or you want to know theological terms or Hebrew biblical terms, which it's right here. I got it right here. I, I mean, the research has uh, already been done. You want to know some Hebraic words? Uh, I know that you can see that. Um, there we go. Can everybody see that? Hebraic words, and you know, like for example, uh, agada. Agada is made. It means story or parable. Okay, it's a Hebrew. You know, so if you like apocalyptical ideal teaching pertaining to Revelation, apocalyptical. And then you got um, words and definitions like scholatism, scultism, uh, synoptic gospel. What is a synoptic gospel? It's a term used to refer to the first three gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it gives you an idea of how seminarians, theologians think, those who in leadership, those of you are in the, in the, in the Supreme Council. Those who make decisions based on biblical truth doesn't matter what your brand is and who's how you organize, and it even has some history and a little touch of historic writings in here and letters. It also gives you an idea, um, a lot of expository to terms that will help you understand the Bible. And this is a basically a teaching text. This is a teaching text. This is a teaching text, and it, you know. It tells you right there. And see, when you know more, you, you, you live better, but also you can help, you can teach, you can spread the gospel that way. You know, a lot of us never been trained how to witness, how to take and consider, uh, share without being offended. There's not really much training on the Baptist side, unless you're a Southern Baptist, they may have some training because um, they do believe in, um, they do believe in, um, mission work and mission work. Some call it pioneers. Some call it mission work. Going to other countries where Christianity is not that strong, or they're receiving uh, financial support from that ministry, and uh, there's a lot of that doing that, doing it. And uh, there's training required, but you need training as a witness, so the word can go to every corner of the earth, but right at home. That's just my belief, and people have to have a hunger. The organization has to have a hunger to grow. In order to grow, you have to reach people. You have to go where they are. You can't expect them to come to your four walls or your cocoon and say, hey, we're going to worship here. You got to give them a purpose. You got to reach out to them. That's, that's, that's the bottom line. So it's a great book, guys. Get your hands on it for, for $19. This is a lot of information uh, that will bless you. And it'll definitely give you an eye over and tell you and also help you discern, you know, between right and wrong. Now, this book right here, Breaking the Chain, is really exactly what it says. 
is breaking the change of bondage. Because there are a lot of people in bondage, spiritual, physical, mental bondage from ministry that have great intentions, great goals, but their drive is driving them. It's, it's the work of Satan. That's the bottom line. It's, it's the work of Satan. And it talks about a lot. I, I decided to share a lot of here. Um, and, you know, I, this was, matter of fact, this was my first text. And breaking the chain of bondage came to me um, after it's my experience in ministry, through, my, through ministry. And I've seen good and I've seen some not so good. I've seen some politically correctness. I've seen some things that are are controversial. And I've seen some things that definitely will, you know, to make somebody want to go Islam on you, you know. And that's why I see a lot of young men venturing, traveling, going to Islam and leaving Christendom, leaving their family because of what they see in the church. And a lot of times they see what the Bible says and they see what the church the congregation do and the organization and they get turned off, you know, women too. And as, and, and that's that's a tragedy in itself because, you know, we know God is love. We should have that same God love within ministry and still being firm, gentle yet firm, instructor in the uh, laws of God too and, 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 and keeping the content. Because if anything that be happens, they, you know, of course, it'll get confusing. So, um, in breaking the chain of bondage, we try to br uh, bring unwoven the devil in the cloak and wearing who's wearing his cloak in deception. You got devils in the on the pulpit, devils in the choir. You got Satan, who's in, in who's definitely the chair chair council member of the entire organization. You know, so it's about exposing. You know, a lot of times we don't even know where the cross is. Did you know the cross originally started in Egypt? The sign, the design that we know is the cross originally come from Egypt and it originally come from Babylonian society. The, the symbol itself. I'm talking about the symbol, not the cross of the uh, suffering of Christ. But a lot of times we got to look at things a little bit different because things is not always what they see. OK, and, uh, and that's why I don't carry the crucifix um, symbol anymore, because. There's more than one style crucifix that was that time. So it's just a matter of which crucifix Jesus was crucified on a tree in one translation. Another one said a stake. Another one said, uh, 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 you know, some say cross and then King James. But when you really get down to it, it's tree. Straight up and down. A straight up and down post. Stretch up. And uh, not stretch this way, because how can you carry something like that and then carry two pieces of wood that's kind of heavy, you know, from one part of the building and quite sure it's hot and then to be executed after being beaten up so many times. I mean, it's, we can talk about this in detail. So it just show you about the different crosses, because every organization has a different cross. And then some have globes. So. Um, the changes in the church. I discussed the changes from the early church to the earlier church of the 19th century to now. Significant change. History of creation. The family, I discussed family and marriage, how we have became strained, how our relationship can be is daunted because the biblical uh, marriage has changed. Um, talk about divorcement. And how God feels about divorcement. Talking about um, believers in different denominations in the United States and why do we have these denominations. To also talk about non scriptural tradition of the church and the body of Christ. Conduct, our conduct, how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. Uh, there are things that would bring wrath to God, really a death. We do definitely experience it in that right to this day. I mean, we got a plague. Uh, we had SARS in China, now we got another plague in China. I mean, earthquakes everywhere. Just uh, a few days ago, there was an earthquake in, between Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, or West Virginia. And there was an earthquake right at the Caribbeans. And there's volcanoes erupting every, you know, all course of the globe that were extinct or have been just awakened. You know, then the way it's been asleep for a thousand years, and here's out, it's, it's doing this thing. And we're talking about a false narrative of global warming, which is... That's another story. Um, also, we talked about chapter 12, non-scriptural traditions. Then we go into uh, non 
scripture religion and non-scripture traditions as a whole, misunderstood traditions, the work versus justification, because a lot of times you got folks that say, hey, you're going to heaven if you do some work. And, uh, you know, and then that conflict was the justification, because if we're justified, we do this because we're already justified, not to get justified, you know, to understand. Occupation of the 12 apostles of their time, they walked the earth. What would they do? What was their profession? Before they connect with Jesus Christ, what's their profession? What was Jesus' profession? Okay. There's a scope of history that we don't even know. And, and that they have done. Um, type of life. What kind of life did they live? What what type of people are they? And we know they travel with Jesus, but who are they? Okay, you want to know. Uh, what are the true pastors? We got a lot of pimps out there now. Everybody's trying to get a car. Everybody's trying to get a big house, a mansion. They're building empires. Millions of dollars. Billions of dollars. Some are becoming super rich off of the backs of tithing. Uh, and that's not biblical, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I understand you love your man, your man of God, um, but let's take this, let's take this in consideration that Jesus is your man of God because he's 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 the Son of God, and the focus should be on Him uh, in worship and spirit and the truth, not your pastor. Your pastor is just a messenger, just been chosen, ordained to do good works. Not to uh, elevate himself or herself, but we'll talk about that too. But that's in the book. Uh, seminary versus cemetery. There's some seminaries that are doing great works, like Liberty University. They're going to be great, provide, providing great challenges and great training for for uh, God's people. And then you got some just producing politicians, ministers, uh, who's out for the wrong reason. So we just got to be careful of the institution. All, all is, education is great, but to be fruitful about, discern about institution of learning and their mission statements and what they really stand for. Okay. And believers can do and cannot do in dealing with false pre pre preachers and false teachers. Uh, this is another taboo topic that a lot of people don't like to talk about, but a lot of people have faced especially in my area, surrounded. You know, pastors come and go. You got some that's good, and you got some who stole, you know. So you got to be very mindful of the type of leadership that you have and be very careful. What's the mark of a false pastor? You know, the Bible does talk about the false prophets, okay? Jesus talked about false prophets. So, guys, you definitely want to be mindful of that, and this book covers that as well. And uh, I like I covered a, the book. The books cover a lot. You want to get your hands on this book. You really do. And this book. OK, you definitely want to get your copy. Another book, outstanding book is Hurricane Katrina and I. It's a beautiful city of New Orleans. That's how I looked when I was there. I took that photo shot. And a number of photos, and it covered my experience, not just in New Orleans, but in other places as as, as a National Guardsman and Army Reservist. Okay, and and I and, and I'll tell you, joining the Air National Guard in, in particular in Virginia was the best decision I ever made, as well as joining the Army. And if you ever consider a career in the military, I highly encourage you to do so. And if you want to look for an opportunity to serve in ministry in the military, the chaplaincy is always is, is a great opportunity. But you have to get your credentials, and credentials are, of course, you being you being chosen by God to to spread the good news. Two, you start working towards your education. You being part of a ministry that's training you. That's the training you giving you good training. And you need seminary educational training, and you need that credential. Then you also need to get your ordination. And I'm talking about real ordination. Not to fake these phrase certificates online. Get an ordination. Get, or, get ordained. You, in order to do that, you have to get ordained. There's a lot of ministry that will support you 
in that effort because you're trying to become a chaplain. There's ministry that will not help you. And I'll be straight up with you. That will not support you. It may not have a clue about how to help you. So pick and choose your ministry support carefully. And I really mean that. And then once you do that, then you then you will take your paperwork and be interviewed to join in an ecclesiastical endorsement endorser that is fundamentally it's a nonprofit organization that is connected. That is the ministry that is connected to with the government that's authorized to ordain you so you can work in a ministerial capacity under the federal government as a career or in the hospital setting. Because there's a lot of people in my area who are hospital chaplains who are not uh, qualified. What do I mean? They're volunteers. And there's a severe shortage of qualified hospital chaplains. There's a need for hospital chaplains in the prison system, okay? Federal prison. I can't speak for the state. It's a whole different uh, thing. You need an ecclesiastic endorsement. You need your MDiv. You need your uh, background check to be right. And you need to be ordained, licensed, or, and, and, or ordained. Now, some places just ordain you. Uh, Baptist, they, they license you first where you get your experience. And then they ordain you. Some places require you to go to seminary first. Then they ordain you after you graduate. It depends on the organization, all right? But that's from my experience. But you got to have those ecclesiastic experiences and credentials in order to work officially in a hospital setting. Same thing in the prison, federal prison. Same thing in the military. The military will not have you stand up and preach on the pulpit or do any type of chaplain work, ministerial work, unless you're duly qualified, okay? So if you want to be an assistant, be a chaplain system if you don't want to get that kind of credentials, all right? But those are the things you're going to need. But, and again, my story about Katrina, uh, I introduced, and of course, I talk about day one, the beginning, and my experiences starting with being a first responder um, within the, the Virginia Guard. And I truly, it's, a, it's an eye-opener, I'm going to tell you. I mean, you, you definitely on call. You're definitely on the move, not just downrange, but also home range. And I had the opportunity uh, to learn. Now, I have to experience other national emergencies. I have also been on the movement. I have the, have the opportunity to travel down to Florida for Hurricane Ivan. And uh, there's another couple. I can't remember the other names. But it was an experience. Hurricane Katrina, which led up to Katrina, was definitely an experience. Uh, a lot of the weather patterns that we're seeing experiencing today, it's global. Earthquake, earthquakes to storm. If there was an earthquake, well, I would have been deployed to it, to, uh, first responder to help your, our community. And we need that. And that's the beautiful thing about the National Guard. The National Guard is a state, is, it was, is a, it got its history from the state militia. It's not a militia, it's a complete organization, part of the DOD. Um, and that's is right, also funded and by the state or, or whatever that state is. Uh, I just happen to be in Virginia. Great inst organization, great institution, uh, great experience. And I, I totally recommend every any young man or woman who desires uh, an opportunity that they will not be able to get in civilian world. And I'm telling you, or military is the biggest um corporate organization that I know, okay? And I gained so much from education, experience, training. I could do things that I probably wouldn't have the opportunity to gain had I not raised my right hand. So, guys, thanks to God. And if you're ever looking to become a chap or a seminarian, you definitely want to get with me. You definitely want to, you definitely want to read this book. You want to get some hand on, hand on. These are some great books, guys. I totally endorse it. I am the author. And you guys, you want an autographed copy, you happen to be in the Virginia area, come get with me and I will sign it. All right. I do have a few copies here, but you definitely want to go online. Go to authorhouse.com, type in my name, and you'll see the books I have published. Again, my name is Antonio Arnold. And guys, I definitely, uh, if you need prayer, 
definitely let me know and I will pray for you. But definitely get your hands on these texts because it will open your eyes. Before and, and if you may see some things that was controversial that make you want to go, hmm. And uh, keep reading, keep reading. Look up the word. I did provide you a dictionary uh, that's in the text. Um, two of the texts do have a dictionary that will help you understand this Greek and Hebrew kind of thing culturally and, and why the Bible was written that way. It's a great start to your journey to seminary, I mean, to, to, to a good education or either biblical school that's local in your area. But you definitely want to um, take a look at it. And, and if you're not called, learn the Bible for yourself. Get, get these books and find out what all this stuff talk about. And then talk to your pastor. And if your pastor blow you away, well, if he's open or her open, you got something good. You got something good. I'm not prejudging, condemning. I'm going to use the word condemning, not pre-condemning, but um, just trying to help. So um, these, two, these three books are worth their weight in gold. I put a lot of time, a lot of research. And I, I'm working on my, I probably we started working on my fourth book. I've been, I had a lot of distraction happening in my life. But I thank God for this because it, this book definitely put me ahead. God knew exactly what you're doing. Elohim, Yahweh, Jehovah, that's his name. Because it's in my book. Jehovah, so you see a Jehovah witness come to you, please do not run them off. Have a conversation because Jehovah is his name who sent his only begotten son to die on Calvary. And what is Calvary? Read my book and you'll, so you'll know what Calvary is. I thank you so much, America, for coming. I thank you for watching this video. And there will be some more videos and topics that we can talk about. And I'll tell you, if you do not have a the copy of your constitution, get one, get one, get one, get one, get one. Get this book because I got the first amendment of the constitution for the Commonwealth of Virginia and the United States right here in this book. And if you want to learn why do you go to night out, why we don't celebrate Christmas, you're going to find out in this book. If you find out why we reap what we sow, you will find out from this book. This book will answer questions, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm truly excited uh, that you are here to, to read, my, to take a look. Read my book and click the link on the bottom to, so you can purchase your book. Or just get with it. Send me a note if you're in the local. And then I'll sign one. I'll sign it all for, for you. I'll, and I'll get an autograph. But anyway, guys, I love you. I got to get some rest. But we'll talk again. And may, may have a little lesson here because I love to teach. God bless you guys. Love you. Thank you so much for watching. Again, like, subscribe, share, and most importantly, get these books. Get these books. And we'll talk again. All right. This is Antonio Arnold. Love you. God bless you. We're signing off today.